Now, yeah, hi everyone. I, Homer asked me to talk to you guys about hip replacement and said this is very different to what you've done before. It's got to be interactive. They've got questions. They're, it could be senior guys. It could be junior guys. And so really I'm relying on you guys to, um, to make this fun. For me, hip replacement, it, it's the hardest and the easiest operation that I do. Um, I think it's a funny transition for me. When I went through as a trainee, I just wanted to do as an early trainee who wanted to do joints on their own. I just wanted to do knees because knees just seemed so much easier and the hip was deep down in a hole. And if you suddenly didn't place the incision in the right place or the person was too fat or too muscular, it became a really tough proposition. And so, um, and so I preferred knees, but as you learn more about hips, you realize in the majority of cases, it's a really straightforward operation to do. And it's hugely predictable in terms of the outcome. If you do it well, the patients are all happy. Whereas with knees, you can do it pretty well and they're not that happy. Oh man, Homer, where has she gone? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, uh, by making you host, I've say you have to now enable my screen share. Oh yeah, no problem, no Thanks. problem. Thanks, Um Where is it? Share screen, there you go. Can I just quickly ask um, people like Robert and David Lynn who are more senior, what do you guys want out of this from me? Uh, I don't do hip replacements, so uh, I only do hemis. I've okay. seen like one, but I'm uh, I'm interested to see how, how you guys do it, because in the Netherlands I've seen I've seen like one or two. We always do an interior approach, and I don't know how you do it, but like with the hemis you do a, a straight lateral. So I'm interested in why do you choose this approach instead of the anterior approach in which uh, is a direct different. anterior you mean yeah i'm not sure yeah. how you do it but like in the netherlands everybody the, everybody does anterior approaches uh, uh, routinely for a parotic fracture neck of femur hemiarthroplasty yeah as well wow well I, I wonder what the what what do you think the history behind that is uh they say they have less infections and less uh, luxations. So subluxation, dislocation. Yeah. Okay, well, I have, I have my theories on that. Um, David Lynn? Has he gone? No, no, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, pills for revisions. I was kind of hoping to get a little bit of that, but I appreciate that there's a pretty varied audience here. Yeah, I mean, if you think of any questions, the principles are essentially the same, right? But um, yeah. giving pearls in a talk like this could be quite tricky. So the way, way I approach um, a hip replacement is not really by thinking too much about the age of the patient. Often patients will come to you and say, uh, oh, I want to get it done before I'm too old. And I will tell them about this funny story of a patient I did when I was a registrar at Stanmore. Um, he was 100 years old and I did his hip replacement and I saw him at six weeks and he was delighted. He was delighted with his hip replacement but much more than that, he was delighted with the group physio sessions. He said it's full of 70 year old birds. That's how he described it. And he was one of these guys who had a, a little trilby hat and he thought he was uh, Bing Crosby. But he was flirting with the younger women. That's what he loved the most about it and his pain had gone. Um, so I think age has nothing to do with it. We always talk in orthopedics about physiological versus chronological age. I think the etiology does, and if you're dealing with an older patient who's presenting with arthritis, to my mind, it really is, as we used to describe it, a disease of wear and tear. But if you're, just, if you're dealing with a younger patient who's got osteoarthritis of the hip, then it's secondary, it's invariably secondary osteoarthritis, and if you can't think of the reason, it's because we haven't worked it out yet. And that's where things like uh, hip impingement and FAI have played a significant role in our understanding, particularly of what we call superolateral osteoarthritis rather than the protrusio pattern or medial pattern of osteoarthritis. So always think about that. What, what has caused this, this hip to, to get diseased and to fail? The other thing is the expectation. Again, it's not age related to, 
to expect that an 80 year old lady all she wants is to be able to totter around and walk to her local shop is no longer true right they're all members of gyms and they want to do this and their expectation is to ski with the grandkids and you really need to have a conversation with patients to understand their expectation because hip replacements are great still for for pain relief they are equally great for um function provided it's reasonable function so here in my conversations i undersell to my patients i will say my expectation is that you will get back to skiing on a piece playing 18 holes of golf and playing doubles tennis all right and i think that's a reasonable place to pitch it irrespective of the age because it puts an onus on my patients to then look after the hip um and then the last thing is the personality and here I'm not just talking about the patient's personality, which is very important. So if you get this guy, this Asian looking gentleman that I've put on here and he wants a hip replacement, you doubly have to think about stability and as Robert will call it, luxation, because if he tries to force the hip early into these positions, it will dislocate, right? And then the second thing is the personality of the host bone. I always make a distinction for me, it's like a gamble. I'm not a gambling man, but it's a gamble. The question is, would you bet on this bone and bet something significant, like a thousand pounds? Would you bet a thousand pounds that this bone is going to behave like bone in a textbook? Or are you not sure that you can rely on this bone, right? Because that's really where my decision making around cemented and uncemented comes in uh, and principally on the femoral side. Any questions so far? I don't know if you can see the whole list, Prim, depending on the view you've got, but there are, there are 10 people, um, Robert, David, Lynn, Jim, Yuji, the RLH crew, Odette, and Ahmed, and Jim. Okay. Guys, whenever you have questions, just either shoot them on the chat or shout out. Um, yeah. You can just unmute yourselves and start talking. Yeah. Uh, so, so one of the things that I was, we don't do a lot of, cemented cups throughout training um i think coming through six years i've done maybe a handful of them do you think this is something which is going to be a problem later on um the simple answer is yes i think it is a problem later on um i, I might come on to talking a, a bit more in detail about that later on david but i i think the problem is the acetabulum is a very different phenomenon in terms of how the force is loaded from the implant to the interface to the bone right it's radially loaded so actually um if you do put cement in uh, that radial transmission is evenly spread so we don't have the same worry we do have in the different types of cementing methods in the femur around hoop stresses and protecting the bone Pretty much all of the sorcel bone is actively loaded, whether you go for an uncemented or a cemented hip, right? right? The problem with a cemented hip is you have less control. You have a, a almost equivalent control when you're preparing the acetabulum, right? But the minute you fill it up with cement, you are then operating blind. So you're driving your car in the rain with no windscreen wipers and a truck is driving past and all that gunge is just flying onto your screen. And you are picturing the socket as you'd prepared it to do everything. You also know that you've got to pressurize the cement for two reasons. One is to push the cement into the prepared bone surface. So here you can see the picture of the host bone. In normal bone, you can imagine to get cement into all those spaces, you're putting a lot of pressure on. The second thing is as the, bone is, uh, the cement is about to set, it expands. So if you don't apply that pressure, what it will do as it expands is push your cup out and then change the orientation of your cup. So as a consequence, you're doing the operation for the first time, your boss is standing on the other side and they are unable, once the cement goes in, they are unable to do anything to help you really. And if the uncemented cup goes horribly wrong, right? You can just attach the thing and knock it out. It is a bit of a pain. You're then committed to using screws, but you can reorientate it. If by the time you take everything off a cemented cup and it's horribly wrong, you're talking about another two hours of a cemented revision, right? 
So what happens when people don't realize where they want their cup to sit is they over pressurize and almost push out all of the cement from behind the cup at, in the line of the push, right? Um, this would be great if I had a paper board to draw on. Um, I can try and draw. You can, somewhere. no, you can, you can draw on, on Zoom. Um, is your, is your presentation in PowerPoint or Keynote or something else? PowerPoint. Okay. Um, Look, I've got a thing to draw. Okay. Um, pen. Let me see if I can draw it here. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, that works. So that's your acetabulum like that, right? Going up, it's prepared, right? You did your trial and everything looked really great. Then what you did is you put your cement into that space and then you pushed that way to pressurize the cement. You then insert your cup into there. And actually what people don't teach you is your reference point then is this line here, right? You do not want to sink your cup beyond that, but people don't tell you that. So what most people do is they pressurize and all of this cement gets pushed, not into the bone, but round that way. And you tend to bottom out the cup here. And suddenly now when you do your trial, your standard stem, leaves it unstable. So you end up putting an extra long neck because you've over medialized the cup, right? And that's a common phenomenon to see in total hips uh, done, cemented total hips done by a registrar, right? So the answer then becomes the easiest thing to do is to do an uncemented cup. Because you get rim fit, you're not gonna over medialize it. You can, and people do now not ream all the way down to the true floor for the argument being in a younger patient you want to present uh, preserve bone stock but nevertheless um, to your point I think if you have bone like this which is really parotic then using a cemented implant will give you a lot more predictable outcome than relying on ingrowth it goes back to that question about how much do you know about the personality of the bone and would you bet a thousand pounds that this bone was going to behave as you wanted it to or not so to answer your point, I think, and I'll talk about this in approaches too. I think if you're going to be a hip surgeon, I think you do need to know how to do a good cemented cup and you will hardly ever use it, but you do need to believe and know that you can do it well. And it's the same with all approaches to Robert's point. I think if I was at your stage now, David, I would learn the anterior hip approach, right? I think, I, I would say to all of you, be very wary of a surgeon who comes and says the posterior approach is the only way, right? The chances are that's the only way they know how to do well. And actually a good hip surgeon, if they understand what they're doing, you know, Gareth is the other way. He only uses the London approach, which is a modification of the hard injured approach. And he says that's the way all hips should be done. But actually what he's telling me is that it can be done through that approach really, really well. And I know it can be done through a posterior approach really, really well. And if you're a good surgeon and you understand what it is you're doing, sorry, who's got a shout? Abdullah, did you say something? No. I think it was just David. No, no, sorry, there was, there was another power outage here. Abdullah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, David, but we'll, we'll go on to that further in detail, I'm sure. Yeah, great, thanks. Now, this is, this is really boring, but it is crucially important for any of you guys doing the exam. And for all the younger guys here, I would read Mr. Ramachandran's book and understand it because it's something that these free body diagrams come up in your exam in a variety of scenarios. Um, and the whole idea is you find the, the center of rotation. You have two moments, one working that way, one working that way. And they have to be even. If they were uneven, the whole thing would start to spin. And that's the premise upon which you then calculate what the joint reaction force is. Because it's got to be equal and opposite to the collective forces of both the abductor and the weight downwards. And 
you you know it's it's simple maths in effect you've got a weight here and a distance that gives you the vector similarly you have b being an increased distance and a weight here and the reason it's relevant is if the person is carrying a walking stick right what happens if it's in the same side what it does is increase the joint reaction force if it's on the opposite side then you can imagine b becomes bigger and so it's the moment arm increases to offload the joint reaction force. Equally, they can say, what if you hold a suitcase in this arm? So once you've understood the basic premise, not only does it help you in the exam when they ask you a bit of a riddle around this, it really understands, it helps you understand when you see a patient who says, my hip pain is really bad, but they're holding their stick in the same arm as their pathology, right? The other thing that's very interesting to me is this, you know, like a lot of hip surgery, this has become embedded in the way people think about the hip. And whenever you talk about balancing the hip or soft tissue balancing of the hip, it, they only ever really mean the abductor tone, right? And those of you who've seen my talk about the symbios hips, will know that I fiercely believe that if you take an axial cross-section, looking at the front of the hip and the back of the hip, I think there are forces in action there, which if you don't balance, you will alter the natural version at which that hip wants to sit. Does that make sense? And this will now take me to Robert. So before everyone was on, Robert said, oh, most of you may have heard it, but in, in Holland, they use the anterior approach in order to do hemiarthroplasty for fracture neck of femur. In this country, we use the anterolateral approach almost consistently. But recently, there has been a vogue for people. Hi, Alex. Hello. Um, recently, there's been a vogue for people to start dabbling in the posterior approach. Okay. So now, again, I'm going to attempt some drawings here. Um, oh, yeah, that's it. So. Um, if you can see, that's your cup. That's the version. This is anterior here. Okay. This is your socket, which, if you remember, should be antiverted. So I've drawn that badly already. Yeah, so excuse that. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a soft tissue envelope here and a soft tissue envelope here. Okay, and these are naturally balanced. And when you use an approach, you are going to cut that in the anterior or anterolateral approach, and you are going to cut that in your posterior approach. Once you've cut it, you are then relying on the intact opposite side to get your intraoperative balance of that hip. So when you check your tension, you want to know if it's, um, if it's going to be stable afterwards, then whichever approach you use, you are relying on the intact opposite side to get your soft tissue tension right. Okay? So now, if you think about a fractured neck of femur, I talk about this uh, quite a lot in the morning meeting when people listen. Um, what you all will remember is when you make your neck cut for your hemi from the front, you often don't get a clean cut at the back. And the reason is, this is the tension side, and this is the compression side of the fracture. And what you have is you have an intact bone with a clean cut here, but you have comminution here as the hip has gone into that position and the leg has gone into shortened and externally rotated. Okay? So you do this approach, you know that this is the compression side, so that soft tissue envelope has not been stretched. This, on the other hand, as the tension has been applied, has been stretched like an Achilles tendon before it fails. I I'm asking you to think of it that way, that's not how it is, but so this has been stretched. If you now use a posterior approach where you cut this, I put it to you that you're relying on a stretched anterior capsule as your reference for the tension of your hip replacement. So at the arthroplasty meeting, we often see in a fracture neck of femur people putting very long necks on 
because they kept jacking it out because this was stretched in order to make it stable. When you use the anterolateral approach, you're relying on an intact soft tissue envelope posteriorly. So actually you get a much better reference point. And it's the same with the true anterior approach. What you actually do, because you don't divide any muscles, the entire gluteus, uh, medius and minimus are intact even though you cut the capsule. And to Robert, Robert, to you, I would put it that that is why they find it so much more stable than conventional approaches. And again, to support my point, once you've balanced this, it's very often that when you try and repair your hardinge approach, you find that it's very tense in that middle, in that middle section. So you, you're reattaching across there and you get a good closure here and you get a good closure here, but your closure here is slightly tenuous, even if you've left a nice cuff to repair onto. And I think when you go back to revise these patients, David Lynn, for a tip on revision, is in those patients, if you're coming anteriorly, you will often see a very white area with possibly a little hole. Homer, you would have seen this for sure, but it just looks like it's dead. And that's because I think it's been overstretched in the repair as they've jacked it out, jacked out that posterior capsule as far as they can. Any questions on that slide? Homa, any comments? Alex, do you remember we did this um, total hip replacement for fractured neck of femur through an anterolateral approach? You did the operation? Did yes, the yes. Now, but it was. Um, it did feel much more satisfactory. I, 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 um, I'm, I'm totally on board with the theory and practice. Yeah. But, but what's funny is, Homer, you will not see this explanation anywhere. Mm. Right? This is something that I've come up with. And, uh, you know, I, whenever I say it, a lot of hip surgeons will go, oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. But actually, yeah, I've never been asked to write it up and nobody really talks about it. It'll be a nice thing to do in a cadaveric study. Yeah, so and there are anyone... people. There are case series about with, um, you know, suggesting that that it is a good thing to do in terms of the dislocation rate. Yeah, I think that's the end point, and that's that's why I was asking Robert about the Dutch practice. Is the end point is people will say, oh, there is a different, and it came up in our trauma meeting. People were saying, why are all these uh, total hips for fracture neck of femur that we're seeing suddenly having these really long necks? Because mm. all the cuts seem in the right place, all the positioning seems right. So what's gone wrong? And that's when I stand up and draw this diagram, generally. Right. Okay. Is there, may I ask, is there, is there a big difference in the soft tissues in an arthritic hip, for example? Uh, could it also be explained by we're used to dealing with uh, stiff, scarred uh, capsules in arthritic hips. And then when we... The, the, the simple answer is absolutely yes, Alex. Yeah. Uh, but, but what I would say to you is the pathology, depending on how arthritic and stiff the hip is, when you go in, the pathology is often not in the muscle layer. It's in the capsular layer. Yeah. So we see this also at hip arthroscopy. If they've got even very early osteoarthritis of the hip, so radiologically normal, a bit of signal on MRI, and actually I'm saying arthritic because when I get in there, they've got small patches of bare bone, right? That's not an osteochondral injury. In those patients, the pathology seems to be thickening of the capsule. Yeah. Right? And most of us are doing a capsulectomy, not in hemiarthroplasty, but in total... Uh, total hip replacement and I think some people are not but you're absolutely right in the fracture neck of femur the capsule is far less reliable and that's why all these stories about repairing the capsule I don't think again if you're a betting man you're not going to bet on the strength of a repaired fracture neck of femur capsule versus a repaired osteoarthritic capsule it's just much thicker and much stronger yeah and yet people will talk to you about how they do that because you know, I, I worked for guys who said, oh, in, a, in an Austin Moore, which you guys don't use, it was a big head. They'll say, no, no, don't, don't cut the capsule out. Put these stay sutures, pull it open, because we're going to repair that, and that's going to contribute to stability. Mm. Right? So I, you definitely make a good point, and I, I agree with it 100%. 
Does anybody know who this guy is? David Lynn? He Thomas? looks like he's some, related to Trotsky or something, right? But you know the test. Thomas. Thomas. Full name? David Thomas. <laughs> Hugh Owen Thomas. Close. Right, and these are the original pictures of him describing the test. Really, I put this up there because I think we are losing the ability to assess a hip clinically. Right, and does that matter? I don't really know if it matters, to be honest. Um, this comes back to David Lynn's question about the cemented cup, where I feel very strongly that a good hip surgeon should know how to do it. You can get a lot of information from imaging the hip, right? That will, if you know what you're looking for, will give you all the information that clever tests, when we didn't have the level of imaging we have now, used to offer to you. And what I would put to you is not just because I'm, a, I'm really passionate about the history of orthopedics. And the reason I am is it's, it's very, very rare to think of something totally new, right? There are so many super clever, way cleverer than me, and probably most of you, not all of you, but probably most of you, orthopedic surgeons out there and always have been, right? And so for you to genuinely think of something that nobody else has thought of, I would say is almost impossible. They either haven't had the voice or to, to express it, uh, the forum to discuss it, the place in which to publish it, or the inclination for that matter. All of these tests, so what uh, Thomas's test here is describing was the earliest way of describing fixed flexion deformity of the hip. Now the question is, what is the relevance of that? It is pretty much what we were talking about now in terms of if you do a posterior approach to the hip and you do not release that anterior fixed flexion contracture, then the hip will still work, but the patient will mobilize with the hip inflection. Now, because they've always done that and that increases the load on their back muscles, they won't be that bothered, to be honest. But your position and orientation of the cup cannot be conventional even on table bearing in mind that often whatever position we use apart from a direct anterior if the patient's on their side that fixed flexion gets hidden you are not necessarily orientating the pelvis on table like you think you are right and then there are a variety of other tests when we used to look at le le uh, leg leg length discrepancy where we had to work out whether the discrepancy was above the intertrochanteric line or within the diaphysis of the femur or at the distal femur. And there were tests that helped you to do that when you had somebody with a leg length. Now you do a, a scanogram or what I do in my practice is do a, a hip plan CT scan. All that information is readily available. And I would put it to you that one day if that technology is not available to you, are you then totally without skill or are you still able to make a really clever assessment of the hip? Uh, for me, I love the fact that I'm able to do that and I would implore anyone that wants to do hip surgery, learn these skills. It really is what differentiates you. And I think um, if you then move on to, you know, there's a lot of talk now. I'm going to go slightly political and Homer, you'll have to excuse me, but I think it's very important for the younger surgeons that older surgeons, I don't feel that the oldest surgeons, so here I'm talking about the BOA leadership are really looking after you. And so the least I can do is at least be transparent and explain to you what it is that you have as a skill. What I'm referring to, to here is, is Tim Briggs and his GERFT program, where he's starting to determine that only people who do 50 of a certain operation should be allowed to do it. Now, we as trainers have seen surgeons as trainees who require 20 of an operation to become competent at it, others who require 50, and some who require just two or three who are naturally talented. All of these people reach a state of competence before we give them the CCT, so they are competent, 
But at that point, to then pretend that everyone's the same and can only be distinguished by the volume of work they do is actually, for me, a hugely damaging thing for our profession. Because I will come back to this, the only real skill we have is our ability to assess patients and do surgery. And the minute technology comes that allows you to be slightly lazy and give up some of that skill set, you have to accept that you are dumbing down a profession you have worked very hard to get into. So I would say to you guys, it is interesting, still learn about this stuff, assessing the hip clinically so that you know what's gonna come up before the CT scan or the hip plan. It's very satisfying personally, but I tell you, in the cynical patient who's a second or a third opinion, if you tell them all this stuff before you look at their imaging, and it took them six visits or seven visits in the NHS or privately or in the US or around the world for that matter to get a surgeon to tell them what you found just by examining them, it wins their trust and they're hugely impressed by it. Okay, any questions on examination of the hip? Because one of the things I'm gonna do, almost committed me to a second session is I'm gonna try and find a way to just run through the hip examination maybe next time. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Any questions, comments? Swan? What I would say is it, it's also confounded by our time with patients in clinic. Um, it's, you, for, you know, because it, it's so time pressured, it, it's really easy to slip into that um, mentality. Yeah, so, so Alex, I completely once again agree with you. Anyone who sat in in a clinic with me will see that I don't run through this with every patient, right? I have honed down, and this is relevant to the guys who are coming up to the exam, is Daniel Nawabi was one of my trainees who now works in New York. And um, his approach to the exam was very unique compared to anyone else. Obviously, he did all the team working and stuff, but he basically worked out for the clinical exam uh, in the simple cases, not the big case, um, the small cases that you go through, he once he got the examination of the hip and the examination of the knee down pat, he kind of worked out what pathology could they give to me. And once he sussed out what pathology could come his way, he then had an abbreviated examination to just nail that bit of pathology. All right. So if he thought this is a Perthes hip, he had like a three minute Perthes hip examination. Now, those of you who are in clinic with, he won the gold medal, just to just say why that was worthwhile. If you look at my clinical practice, that is in essence what I'm doing, because I don't have the time, like you say, Alex, and I can't waste that. It's different if it's a second opinion or a third opinion patient, or if I'm in private practice and I have more time and I think I need to win this patient's trust. But when you're talking about learning, this is why I think it's imperative in your consultant practice when you get there to have one clinic a month maybe that is really cut down so that you can train and teach. And even if a registrar is senior like David or Alex and is on my service, I can then think, well, they can see the patients, they don't need me to be there, but this time they absolutely have the time to run through a full hip examination. What do you yeah, think? That, yeah, that's really useful. All right. Um, next slide. Assessing the hip radio radiologically. So I think this is a really, really important part of what we do. And one of the things that you have the luxury of, which isn't strictly great practice, is that all over the country now in the UK, we basically send patients for radiographs before we see them. So before your patient comes in, if you want to cheat, you can look at these x-rays, right? And they will tell you a story of what bits you want to examine, what the likely pathology is. And earlier I was talking about this pattern of arthritis you see here is, is called superior lateral, okay? Why? Because it's superior and lateral. And it is very different to this pattern of arthritis, which is medial. And the definition for protrusio is you see this line here, right? The ileo ischial line. Basically, once you 
once the head crosses that line medially, that by definition is a protrusio hip. So you can imagine, guys, in fact, let me ask um, Srin, you're on this. Srin? Hello? Yes, hi, sorry, hi, just hi. in clinic. Yeah, you're in clinic? Yeah. Sorry, have you got a patient with you? No, 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 it's fine. It's just okay. Between. So listen, I, I don't know if you heard that last bit, but I've got these bottom two pictures here. This one is superolateral osteoarthritis this one is medial protrusio what are you going to expect to see when you try and examine this person's hip oh uh, possibly a leg length discrepancy uh, maybe i mean look the, the the medial migration is in that direction rather than superior mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. still ballpark in the socket and They've got pathology on the other side. So I put it to you that the leg lengths will probably be not a million miles out. What's going to be okay. much more drastic, do you think? Uh, range of you motion. Think, you... You're right, right. So think simple, stiffness, right? Mm. So these, these, both of these hips are going to be stiff and painful, it's likely, right? Yep. But if you got to this hip, and I told you, because of the protrusio over years, this is going to, this is not a real term, by the way, but just to emphasize, it's going to be super congruent, right? Almost like one of those artificial resurfacings that you can spin. So you can almost roll that bowl, a ball inside there, which means which movements are going to be almost trickily appear normal are going to be abduction, adduction. It right. may even tolerate a bit of flexion, but in my experience, internal and external rotation with the leg in extension are very, very limited in someone with protrusio. On a superlateral pattern, firstly, if they flex, they tend to flex into abduction and external rotation, a bit like a Perthes barrel hip. So a round hip you can see will move in any plane that it wants to, right? but a barrel shaped hip can only move in that plane. It can't really move in a different plane. So they will traditionally flex up into abduction, external rotation. That will be painful, right? But this patient abduction, you can imagine, is gonna be what they call hinge abduction and is really going to be irritable. Whereas this patient may abduct normally, right? This patient up here is gonna be your leg length patient, right? with a big discrepancy. Sorry, I'm just gonna move this to see what I've got here. This person, you can see there's a fixed pelvic obliquity when they lay down on the, on the mat to have their, unless it's a standing. If it's a standing film, you've got to think that they've got a leg length discrepancy that's led to a pelvic obliquity. If they're lying on their back and it's not a standing image, I'm immediately thinking, is there some disease of the spine that has left them with a fixed obliquity of the pelvis? right this one down here i'm thinking sepsis or radical avascular necrosis my old boss tom bucknell used to call it gin hip okay now what you can also think so there's the first bit which is the clinic consultation but also intraoperatively uh day uh who's uh, abdullah come in abdullah you with me? Habibi. Okay, Swan. I can't, I can't see his name here now. I think he might have been. No, no, he's on RLH to RLH. Or have they dropped out? Was on separately. No, we're here. Can you hear? Yeah, Swan, I can hear you. Oh, there's RLH, RLH. Yeah, is, yeah, Ab yeah. is Abdullah Habibi with you? He's on the phone. He's on the phone. Is he? Okay, Swan, Swan. You're yeah. a shoulder expert. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this protrusio hip, yeah. you have to do a total hip on. I refer what, to it as that time. Yeah, of course. But tell me what, what you think. Tell the youngsters what you think the first challenge is going to be when this appears. Mr. Millington has listed it and said, okay, for Reg to do. Uh, um, 
I, I guess you can't get it out, right? So yeah, like, dislocation, okay. right? It's a nightmare. Sometimes but before like before it, dislocation, right? Swan, yeah. even in the approach, what is the first thing, if you can remember back to doing your first hemi-arthroplasty on your own? So until now, you've always had a senior, like a reg or a consultant assisting you. Yeah. And you're doing the first one on your own with a younger person. Yeah. What was the first thing you remember from that? Uh, blank it out. So one thing is the approach. Like get into the position that you want to. to yeah, to so the approach. approach just seems a little bit more of a struggle. And the reason was that experienced person was just rotating the limb, putting mm. the right tissues under tension. Yeah. They kept moving it without necessarily telling you because it was natural to them. It wasn't intentional. Yeah. They weren't part of the stonemasons yeah, yeah. or the so stone or whatever. Do, but the suddenly business. that wasn't happening and you yeah. were like, oh my God. So no, 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 we were very clear. Yeah, I, yeah, okay. But you're yeah. absolutely right. You can't get the leg position. The tension's not right. You can't right. Get so foot, even right. before you dislocate, the approach is a bit more of a struggle. Right? If you can get the position right and be patient and you get there, you may not get the amount of rotation that you normally do to be able to dislocate it. So the question are, is what are the tricks in that situation? David Lynn, trick okay. number one, and Alex Karalambos, trick number two, please. What would you do? Uh, Institute neck cut. Right, so you've got the easy one, the napkin ring cut. Does everyone know what that is? So you've got the neck, you can barely visualize it. Stay away from wh where the lesser trochanter is because you don't want to compromise the ideal cut, but you basically make two cuts in the neck and it comes out and it looks like one of those, you know, in the Michelin star restaurants that uh, the rich consultants, not me, but they go to, you get bone marrow. It's a round ring with bone marrow in the middle. But once that comes out, it takes the tension off, right? And then you should be able to externally rotate, make your neck cut, and then using a corkscrew, you take the head out. Now, even that is not easy all the time with protrusio, and you may have to get a saw into the head and cut the head up into four bits to get them out. Carol Ambos, he took the easy one. What's the other trick that you might use? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I would say a series of soft tissue releases. Yeah, so soft tissue, again, you're limited, but doing a big capsulotomy, depending on your approach, a capsulectomy is really a good idea. What I'm thinking- Remove the is, by, the, by the way, so you guys know, this is how examinations used to be in my day. The guy would think of one rare thing and kind of go, what am I thinking of? And if you didn't get it, you'd fail. But no, so there is a trick earlier than the napkin ring where you put the bone hook into the GT right? You can tap it in if you like, and then you're pulling a bit like a shant spin in an acetabular fracture, and you can pull out and then try and, and dislocate it, right? Whichever way you're going. Uh, doesn't always work, but if it does work, then it comes out quite nicely, and it's just a, a tip and trick. How are we doing for time, Homer? I know these guys have to go for work. Um, they, 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 sometimes more people join, you know, when you think you're done. So um, it can. Okay, be well, I'll keep going. Um, this was really um, interesting on many levels for me. This slide, which is things to think about, and we've kind of covered the first one with protrusio, but sometimes, especially when the department talk about strategy, I'm described as a pessimist, right? And I would say, people who know me would say, God, this guy is so optimistic. He is so positive and happy, and he will always think of a solution. And the reason those two things coexist is I worry about all the potential things that can go wrong. I try and identify them early. And then in my plan, I try and avoid ever getting there. So if there are 10 things that you identify between your clinical exam and your radiological evaluation by the time they come to surgery, then you already in your mind are eliminating six or seven of them so they can't happen, right? And so that's why I don't want people to worry because obviously we're in an era of well-being, but worrying about what may go wrong in a, in a time of calmness rather than during the operation 
for me, moves you from being this guy to being her down here. All right. And so I would encourage you in the best possible way that worrying is very helpful when it's done in the right framework with the right intention. If you don't plan, you know, the old kind of fail to plan and plan to fail. If you don't have the calmness and Alex, again, clinics are not ideal, right? Because you're under pressure of time. But if you guys got into the routine of keeping the two interesting cases or difficult cases uh, to the end, and then built up a portfolio of interesting cases, you will see as years go by, if you revisit it, half of them will have become dull because they're so routine. But the first time you saw them, they were interesting. But actually over time, if arthroplasty is your thing, you'll be building a library of very interesting cases that you can then use for teaching, use for talks, um, and also monitor to see how they did because it's very satisfying the more complex the case um, to see how they did and, and know that they did well. Choosing an implant, I come back to my story about history, right? So the earliest hip replacements is this picture up here and resurfacing was nothing clever, right? Jude, people like that, all their interpositional ivory implants were all designed very much along McMinn's design technique, right? And you can see here the Haygrove's ivory nail, 1927. Right, it's not a million miles off of what resurfacing was. You can also see 101 things that either were very difficult to put in or failed that we've tried. So going back to them would be crazy. This is the original Charlie monoblock, right? And when modularity was introduced, what it did do is give people versatility. So by modular, what I mean is it gives you different options to get things absolutely right. The danger with that is you stop paying attention because there's a lot of leeway in what you can get away with, right? And if you've ever worked on my service, you will know I don't like that. I want you to pay attention to detail and you're only using modularity when there is a very good reason to do it. Because again, what it's doing, if the more modularity you use, and I'm, listen, I'm not having a dig at the face changing liners and the dual mobility guys or anything like that. It is defunctioning some intrinsic skills that you have as a surgeon and dumbing you down, right? There are definitely places where you do need a face changing liner and you do need dual mobility to increase uh, the outcome options for your, your patients. Um, but don't lose the fundamental skill. And, and very famously, this was the, the story behind the LCS mobile bearing knee replacement. I know this is a hip talk, but you mustn't forget that that had by a country mile, the best results at 20 years of any knee replacement, right? But then they launched it everywhere with the 20 year results. And today I don't think anybody is doing the LCS knee, right? And the reason was they marketed it as being mobile bearing so you can get everything wrong and the patient will still function well. And so everyone started doing it and they didn't do it as well. And those patients didn't do as well. And to give you an idea, the original LCS knee had a metal backed patella and it didn't fail, right? Because it really compensated for femoral component and tibial component rotation through the range of motion. Anyway, back to hips. So monoblock was very difficult to do. The original McKee Farah, which is the metal on metal from Norwich, was a metal on metal articulation, but actually all he was doing was pairing up uh, the Thompson's hemiarthroplasty with a metal cup. The Kerbool for me was the first uh, true copy. You can see it's not a million miles away from the Charnley, but it got into the French uh, vernacular very very quickly um, the Exeter this is the design modification because Charlie was doing well Exeter changed from a polished stem to a matte stem that was a disaster they tried to shape that off so that you didn't have to go as lateral on the GT because they were knocking it off but eventually they realized that made it fatigue fracture across here and so everything has evolved nothing has really stayed the same um, whether 
whether you use a cemented implant or an uncemented implant is now being dictated by other people like girth and the age of the patient. But I would take you back to what I said. If you can't rely on the bone, then I would implore you to not gamble and to use a cemented implant. Both the Exeter and the Chan Lee, but there's a number of them, um, have such good track records that you can't justify as a surgeon, to my mind, gambling. That doesn't mean if an 85-year-old has really good bone that I'm, I'm totally happy for you to use an uncemented implant. But again, I go back to, to this thing. Be very wary of an American surgeon or even in the UK, somebody who says, I only use uncemented implants or somebody likewise who says, I only use cemented implants. And this is one of the downsides when it comes to choosing a fellowship is I think Don Howie's fellowship um, in Adelaide is brilliant for cemented hips. Absolutely brilliant. But they do no uncemented work. And equally, if you go and do the Don Garbu's uh, fellowship in Vancouver, which used to be Clive Duncan, Baz Masri, now it's Garbu's Masri, uh, Gradanus. Um, they will teach you how to do uncemented Zimmer stuff, trabecular metal, and it's brilliant. But if I could really orchestrate and speak to these guys and get some level of understanding of what their offering is, the perfect fellowship is six months with, with Howie and six months with uh, the Vancouver guys, right? That's when you really learn the skill. Um, but sadly, people don't think like that. Approaches to the hip. I think we've covered this a bit. When you talk about it, again, nothing is new. The anterior hip isn't really that much different from the Smith-Peterson, which is Sartorius tensor fasciolata. And Hoyter is the guy who described splitting tensor fasciolata there, peeling the muscle off, splitting the uh, the fascia there and getting in and the reason for that is one this plane is sometimes the higher you up harder to find but also if you do find it successfully you've often pranged the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh so the anterior approach guys have pretty much accepted that that's the way to go the watson jones was an interesting lesson for me so keith tucker even though he was very poor at verbalizing I think thought the same way I did in that if you were going to be a hip surgeon, uh, he didn't have much time for people saying this is the only way. He thought you should learn all the ways. And the one way you hadn't learned, chances are by the time you got to him was the Watson Jones. So he made you do the hip replacements through Watson Jones, firstly to see how good you were at learning a new technique because the patient was now supine and you had to orientate the cup and the version that way but also the approach. Um, and again, I would say it was a, a very clever thing to do, but he just did it in a way that often upset people and caused people to either succeed or fail that I don't think is a good way of training. And it's certainly one that um, has been abandoned now. But I would implore all of you, what you're trying to do in an approach is find an internervous plane, cut as little of the soft tissue as possible, and yet get very good access to make sure that you don't compromise on the quality of your positioning. Okay. Any questions on approach? Um, when you revise a hip, Mr. Rachan, do you try and, and use the same approach as was used before a bit like when you were talking about the anterior and posterior tissue envelope before? Yeah, so to be honest with you, there are factors that come into play. That's a great question. So the first factor is how long has this hip been in, right? If the hip has been in an awfully long time, then the first thing I will tell you is the scar is often in the wrong place. And like, uh, you know, that famous joke about the directions to Dublin and the guy says, I wouldn't start from here. Um, don't use the same scar if the operation was done a long time ago and is not in the right place. It may be in the right place, but that's your first thing. The okay. second thing is the tissues are likely to have healed to an extent that they are pristine and it's okay for you to go in whichever approach you're more comfortable with. Okay. okay. The equal is true in that if it is very, very recent, then I would go through 
the same approach that the surgeon used before, simply because you don't want to damage the healthy tissue and you want to know the state. If you use the other approach, a new fresh approach, actually tissue diagnosis and, and planes finding that all of that will be easy. But if you go back to my original diagram as to which soft tissue you're relying on for reference, you're now relying on damaged, diseased, post-surgical tissue, right? If it is infection, if you use the same approach, it will give you a real insight into what is viable and your debridement. So very late, do what approach you want. Very early, go through the, uh, the approach that they used. Then there's the group which are multiple revisions. And here, finding tissue planes is a very difficult proposition. So one, extend your incision so that you can find healthy tissue just to give you a reference point of knowing where you are and then stick with the approach that you are most comfortable with for access. And here in revision surgery, I would implore people, unless it's a really simple primary in a, in a skinny person, to go to the extensile approaches, so anterolateral or posterior, and abandon the anterior approach. Um, and when you get to that patient, not only that that's had recurrent surgery, so the tissue planes aren't clear, not only would I say go to the approach that you're most happy with, you have to learn what I call the blind cut to bone approach, right? So if it's posterior, you identify everything, you are not going to identify uh, the gemelli or obturator internus. You do need to identify where the sciatic nerve is because the scar tissue often pulls it much higher than it would normally be, and often in healthy tissue it falls away here it won't um, but once you've identified it identify that old posterior approach line and go hard to bone lift it as one plane and repair it as one plane with suture uh, bone sutures if you're going anterolateral hard inch again go into vastus lateralis which a lot of us who modified it we avoid but go into vastus lateralis all of that as one plane up through gluteus medius lifted up okay um and that's my approach to revisions great thank you is that all right yeah and again you can see how valuable it is if you're comfortable with both approaches yeah and and just on the point of approach if anybody has worked with me with the high hip center patient dysplasia and you're doing a primary hip you will see what I do sometimes if I can't, I've done all the simple soft tissue releases and I can't mobilize the hip and I've used a posterior approach. I then relocate the hip. I then do a modified hardinge approach from the front. And that leaves me with a little sliver of gluteus medius. Everything else is gone. And then if I need to, again, this isn't described. I do a wedge osteotomy, very narrow into the greater troc but about that long and I flip it up. So now there's nothing attached. The only thing that's gonna limit how far I can pull this hip down is the, the sciatic nerve and I bring the hip down. The first thing I then do if I think I'm in the right place, uh, post when I start my closure is I flip that bone thing back into the slot and if I've done it right, there will be a gap at the bottom end, but it will sit in that slot, yeah? And then I fire a screw to hold it in place. And then I reattach the anterior and posterior repairs. And they won't be going to where they conventionally sat because you brought the whole hip down. That's my, um, my take on approaches to the hip. Any questions? Preparing the femur, you know, for tips or tricks, please understand the difference between a rasp and a brooch. Um, brooches, rasps remove bone. Brooches, particularly things like this one, which is the Karai brooch, they're looking to impact, not remove bone, but compress that bone. So it's a very different feel and a different idea of what you're trying to do. A brooch is the same as a, as a rasp. Uh, sorry, a brooch is, is, is doing this, right? It's compressing the bone. The rasp is removing the bone. So the exeter pattern that you will see on theirs is a rasp. It's looking to remove bone. 
And when you see guys doing really nice, completely white out cement mantles, and you're pressurizing for love and money with your third generation technique, and you're just getting a little bit of infiltration, I can tell you the majority of them are using a curette to clear out a big wide space, even into the GT, in order to get that white out image. Okay, so don't be disheartened. And I think it's okay to do that because now we know that those cemented implants, if you do that and do it well, are gonna last 25 to 30 years. The initial reluctance to do that was one, getting that cement out if you were gonna do a full revision was difficult. And two, people thought that was the bone stock that you could then rely on in revision surgery to get your purchase of the next implant. But you know, for me, it was a bit like people used to say when I was in a, a, a the stage many of you are at, is they would say, I'm not doing this as well as I probably could, because when it comes to revision, it will be easier. You know, and even experienced guys, so, uh, you know, Paul Allen, the knee surgeon at Harlow, who's an immensely talented and brilliant surgeon, he would not shoot in a to primary total knee, he would not shoot cement down the tibia, because he said, that's the bit that's hardest to get out when I revise it. I haven't worked for him recently, so someone can correct me. He may have started doing that because now we know that uh, the PFC knee, which he used to use, lasts 20 years. You know, so you don't mind sticking cement down. He's switched to the attunes, so he may be still being wary. But I just want to tell you, uh, what can go wrong in preparing the femur? Right? The first thing and most obvious thing is you can miss the canal. And the more dysplastic hips I do, the more I recognize. So very early in my career in a private patient, uh, I did an uncemented hip, uh, went really well, woke up, the patient was great. I saw him the next day, but even in a private hospital, it was only the next evening that he had his x-ray and somebody phoned me up and says, you need to come and have a look at this. Um, and basically I'd put the femur out of the back of uh, the femoral component out of the back of his femur. So I was like, oh my God, how did I do that? You know, this operation seemed to go so well. He was a youngish guy. And then I took him back to revise him literally the next day. And I couldn't get, so I, I exposed it all the way down. I found the hole. I couldn't get the rasp or the implant past that hole. And in the end, I had to take out some of the posterior cortex of the proximal femur because I now know that was the heli torsion that I talk about, but he had a very dysplastic appearance of his proximal femur. And where you guys will see this is in your uh, cephalomedullary nailings for parotic fractures in the elderly, or for your nailing in younger fit people with diaphyseal fractures, where sometimes you think my entry point is spot on. Why am I so off in the neck and the head? And the reason is they may have this degree of heli torsion that you're not expecting. It's rare, but now I don't miss it. And the reason I miss it, uh, don't miss it isn't because I'm clever. It's because every young patient that comes in with arthritis, I'm looking at the imaging differently thinking, is, could this be a potential? The next thing you can do is you can fracture the femur. If you fracture the femur and you're clever, most of the fractures are around the calcar. They're recognized very early. And by putting a good, strong cable that you can tension, you pretty much eliminate that problem, whether you're an uncemented or a cemented guy. If you don't recognize it, then that's a bit of a disaster. The other thing with dysplasia and uncemented stems is if your entry point isn't absolutely right, to go down, you will very early get what I call three-point fixation. So at your entry site, anterior cortex, posterior, and you'll see this on your lateral image of somewhere on the AP in the arthroplasty uh, meeting, Mr. Millington saying, oh, oh, oh that's, that's undersized, that's undersized. But when you look on the lateral, you can see that you've got the three-point fix, and that's why you've got the sound change with your rasp, and that's why you stopped. Um, but apart from that, really, you know, I put the, the kit at the bottom. You don't know, you know, that's not a kit I use, but basically the point is third generation technique of bone preparation for cementing is very important. 
And to David Lynn's original question around the cup, I would still try and learn that as you go through from someone who knows how to do it, not from someone who just, just does it. The problem is in the fractured neck of femur patient, I don't think you, anyone needs to worry about that cement master, uh, mantle lasting 20 years. But in a primary hip replacement, you do, right? And as a consequence, it's easy to allow bad habits to creep in, in the hemiarthroplasty scenario, but when actually that might be a great opportunity to learn. The other thing is, make no mistake, when you pressurize cement properly, the embolic phenomenon, whether it be bits of cement or more commonly bits of fat, are phenomenal, right? When you see that video, if you haven't seen it, you must just YouTube it, of an echo while someone is pressurizing the cement. You know, it is incredible what's thrown off. And in the elderly patient, it is the one in an exam. If somebody's an examiner is hinting why you shouldn't cement your femur, that's possibly what they're driving at. Any questions around preparing the femur? The other thing I would say is have a very low threshold if you're finding, if you've identified that the cortices are thick and your early size is just hitting distally, then the problem if you don't then prepare to get metaphyseal press fit is you will distally load your implant and then get uh, no loading of the proximal bone and so resorption. So have a very low threshold for sticking the uh, I am nailing uh, reamers down and just reaming those cortices to allow you to get a slightly bigger stem. And again, you should have identified that on the x-ray pre-op. Um, how do you determine the level of neck cut? So that's a great question. Um, there's a famous saying, the th uh, this was from a surgical leader in the States. He was a pathologist and he said, the thing I love about surgeons is they measure in millimeters, they mark with chalk, and then they cut with an ax. So we spend a lot of time in our pre-op planning getting millimeter specific neck cuts. And then we end up cutting. If you look at the, the saw cutting technique of many, many surgeons I've seen, and again, anyone who's worked for me will, will see how almost anal I can be around how you saw and the technique with which you saw. Um, in order to get control, because control is what will give you accuracy. So the simple answer to your question is, it's in your pre-op plan, but in most cases, you're looking to go a finger breadth, and you can see how Adrian Carlos's finger is going to be bigger than my finger is going to be different to Miss Ang's finger, but generally it's a ballpark above the lesser truck for where you're making your cut, Okay. And the idea is, again, determined very much on the stem that you use because it is not the neck cut that is determining the sizing of the implant you use. It is where the sound changes as you rasp or broach up, okay? If at that point your neck cut is wrong because what then happens if it's too high is you've lengthened the patient, right? Then you'll get a good idea when you come to revision, uh, not to revision, to trial the implant. If you have a complex patient and you're using a custom hip like the Symbios that I use, then it's in the hip plan as to where you make that neck cut. And that has to be very accurate because there is no modularity. The error that the pathologist was talking about when we cut with an ax is easily overcome if you're within one to two millimeters by modularity plus or minus on the head size. Okay. You can get a very accurate neck cut, but if you remember what I said about pressurizing your cup or medializing your cup, if the cup is over medialized, then suddenly your instability is not because your neck cut is inaccurate, it's because you've medialized your cup. But when I was in the early stages, I don't do it as much unless I'm taking a junior trainee through. I still use the Karai uh, neck cutting guide and I make a little mark right to give me an indicator and the more experienced you become it isn't an accurate measurement but if it's a normal x-ray of the proximal femur then you will see where your mark sits relative to the neck which you haven't cut yet plus the tip of the trochanter right and you can tell if you're way off high or way off low 
There's a good, a good question is what if you're way off low and suddenly you're actually seeing the Lester trochanter? Then you can, again, we're talking about very small margins. You can still get a good press fit with a uh, uncemented stem, whichever one you choose. And you can also get a really good cement mantle, but remember to leave the implant proud. And that's why the Exeter implants and various implants have three lines because the, the implant will still function if you use the bottom line with the implant proud. It will still effectively uh, hoot stress load the cement and the bone, and it will subside in a predictable fashion, and it will not fail over time. Prabhu, is that a reasonable answer? Uh, thank you, yeah. Preparing the acetabulum. Okay, this, this is an interesting thing. So the first thing I would say is exposure. I have no issue with what approach somebody uses, but if you don't get your exposure right, even very, very experienced surgeons get acetabular positioning wrong. So Henrik Malkow did this very famous study at Mass General Harvard, where they got all the hip surgeons uh, post-operative acetabular positioning, right? in routine hips, so not where they, they were intentionally trying to put it in a different position. And the scatter chart was all over. And if you took the experienced hip surgeons who were doing large volume, it became smaller, but was still miles outside of the, the, the true box that they wanted. Um, that has led to people talking about navigation and a bunch of stuff. But I would say to you, even to get navigation accurately, you need the exposure so you can get the bone reference points. And for me, exposure is everything. If you then recognize that this is a normal anatomical acetabulum, so you've recognized whether the disease was superlateral or protrusio, but actually the erosion of the acetabulum has not been that great. and There is nothing to suggest retroversion or acetabular dysplasia then you will hear people talk about the transverse acetabular ligament, right? I think in those scenarios, that is a great reference for what your orientation needs to be, right? But I think in dysplasia, which is 10% of your hip replacement practice, right? That will only help you to put the acetabulum where it was originally, which may be wrong for stability, right? And again, people, you know, too many of the big volume hip surgeons do a lot of primary hips and are so didactic in the way that they teach, saying mine is the only way, that I'm very wary of Beverland, who I have a huge amount of respect. He's the guy who published this thing on the transverse acetabular ligament. It is helpful, but don't get fooled by it because it can, in a dysplastic hip, force you to put the acetabulum in the wrong place. When it comes to fixation, if it's uncemented you want the bone to look like this right so it's bleeding you don't want sclerotic bone because that's poor for ingrowth but you do not need to drill anything unless you see sclerotic patches you do not need to wash it out because you want the what they used to call the evil humors but all your cytokines and all of uh, all of your chemical mediators for ingrowth you want them to be around and I do my washout once I've impacted the shell, right? Because I want blood in between, not lots, but a little bit of bleeding surface. If you're going for cementing, then you have two levels of fixation. One is micro lock, which is the interdigitation into that kind of appearance of bone. Um, and in parotic bone, that isn't great. And then there's macro lock, which is large holes that you drill. So the more parotic the bone, the less you can rely, I think, on these sort of holes. I would go for three big holes. One going superiorly into the ileum, one down into the ischium. And then the pubic ramus one is often the trickiest to find. And if it is parotic, which it should be if you're doing a cemented cup, then often either using your drill or a McDonald's, you can poke your way or a ring handle spike. You can poke into without perforating bone into there. That tells you where it is and then make your macro lock hole. Okay. You've got that great appearance, which will give you micro and macro lock. You do pressurize the cement, but only to fill those voids. Don't over pressurize. 
and then you use your rim as your reference for where you want to seat the cup. Okay. Um, and that's probably my guide to acetabular positioning. Um, I think it's much easier to revise uh, an uncemented cup. My default is I do not use screws in my primary cup. That isn't because it's easy to revise um, using an explant. It is because if you do it properly and you haven't eroded either the anterior or posterior column, you shouldn't need to. And it shows that you are paying attention, even if it's 20 years down the line, to the guy that's going to do the revision, not from a point of view of extraction of the kit, but about preservation of acetabular bone. So the history of failure of hip replacement is they haven't really failed on the femoral side, they always failed on the acetabular side. Say again? Somebody on video? Are you on video? I'm on video, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you can pop in and get something. Sorry. Two of us trying to work from home. No, we, we, we encourage, um, we encourage uh, you know, like a realistic uh, picture of what's going on well this is nothing today's a day where the kids have gone to school yesterday i was trying to do stuff with the kids here it was carnage any questions on acetabulum uh whether it's early early trainees or lynn alex so again i'm very wary of this old teaching of just point the the impactor to the corner of the room right I want you guys to really understand what it is that you're doing. So we didn't talk about it, but an important part is positioning the patient, right? That's very important. Understanding what fixed deformities they have. So you almost have a, a pelvis in your mind or as the uh, fracture guys do, you have a real pelvis and you imagine if this is flexed in this position or it's adducted or it's abducted, what is that going to change from where I want to put this cup? The other thing I often talk about is the person with bilateral stiff hips is when you do your first hip, the pelvis and the other hip are so stiff that you orientate it. The patient is really, really happy. Then you do your second hip where suddenly the other hip is very mobile and the post-op x-ray comes and one of them's like this and one of them's like this. And you're suddenly going, oh my God, how have I got that positioning so wrong? And part of the reason is that you did the first one with a very stiff construct and you did the second one with a very mobile construct. And if you don't understand what it is you're looking at with a great deal of certainty, then in those cases where the old post has come loose or, you know, the Charlie retractor has hooked over the post and has pulled the post round and then the pelvis has fallen, you really have no idea behind the drapes of where you're putting this cup in. Any comments, Homer? Any tips? I've got a question. Hold on. From you. Who's you's iPhone? Is that you, G? Don't know. Anyway, uh, in terms of angulation, right? All the old textbooks, and I'm lucky that I've kept the old textbooks and even the op text from different people when I was a registrar, they all said 45 degrees of abduction, if you're looking at the AP, right, 45 degrees, and then your version, which is going forwards, right, 15 degrees. But if you did a posterior approach, they would say go for 25 degrees, right, because your risk was that you were going to dislocate posteriorly. Uh, yeah, Yubi, I got you. Um, so that was the teaching. Then we got hard on hard bearings and people somehow, and this is what amazes me about these big communities, is they forgot that all of that positioning was based on the complication of dislocation. So it was purely around stability, not around wear of the bearing surfaces. Then as we went to hard on hard bearing surfaces, all the rascals, uh, in all the companies change their optech without telling us and change the abduction angle to 30 to 35 right and suddenly if you'd done a 50 degree cup there were people out there I mean I remember Sarah Muirhead Allwood telling one of my patients as a second opinion that she thought that was 
she didn't have a problem with the hip, but she'd gone to see the other hip and said, oh, I think your surgeon has put this cup in too vertical. Um, and I have to say, in those, in those days, that, that wasn't an issue, right? That it was all about stability. Then we understood, then we understood that actually what we wanted was a combination of stability and bearing wear characteristics, right? And I would implore all of you, if you get to a cadaveric lab or you get a plastic, the next time we have these lunchtime meetings and somebody comes in with the kit for a simple hip, is you get one of those plastic pelvises out and you work out how it is, what is neutral. Ask one of the consultants there to just talk you through so that the first time you're doing it on a patient, the sad thing about training is your consultant will put your hand on and kind of move it a little bit to get it right. And the first time you're left on your own and that hand isn't there, I think you're panicking and you can get it wrong. Whereas in the in 10F, if it's just on a plastic bone, you can really run through how you can get it wrong, how you can rectify it, all that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of my abduction angle, if it's a hip plan patient, then the hip plan has told me what position to put the cup in. I absolutely have to try and reproduce that. If I don't, the hip won't be stable. Otherwise, um, I can get my last case of instability, which I had to revise, was um, an uncemented private patient again that I did, where I'd done his one hip. He was delighted with that, got back to playing golf at the Berkshire. Then he came for his second hip. And he was overconfident in his rehab. And actually what happened, the error number one was I used the same size implants, but his femoral components subsided very slightly, right? That was enough when he went back to playing golf to give him instability. And he went with a dislocated hip to the Chelsea and Westminster. They called me up and said, it looks like the implant has subsided. But what they did then was they did a cemented total hip, sorry, a cemented hip, but left the cup, right? That cemented hip and its version was actually not married up to stability on the cup side, right? Because, and they even said afterwards in a discussion, because it was Charlie Gibbon, who I know very well, Charlie spoke to me and he said, you know what we thought it was the fellow who did it. And he thought the cup might be a bit retroverted for where that stem was, but we left it. And so I had to go in and then revise the cup and antivert it a bit more. And he's back playing golf. But it just tells you that some elements of this until you've got ingrowth in an uncemented hit are uh, dynamic. And you have to protect your patients, especially if they've had one hip go well. How's that? Brilliant. I'm really enjoying all the stories. Give me everyone a wealth of wisdom. More than the tips and tricks. <laughs> well, it's, all, it's all one and the same. Yeah. So trouble and salvage. Trouble and salvage is, I have to say, if you're at Alex Haralambos or David Lynn's stage or Swan in her specific interest, it's horrible to say it, but everyone's thinking it, is you want something to go wrong for the boss if they're a good, calm boss, so that you can see and ask them how they get out of it. So you almost want to see everything that can go wrong and see how the boss gets out of it because that's how you're likely to then try and get out of it uh, once you become a consultant. I would say to you, that's great. And it's, uh, it's, it's harsh, but your consultants all thought that at some point when they were trainees. So don't feel guilty about thinking it. But equally, go back to understanding and thinking about the basic principles, because there will be some solutions that your boss hadn't thought of that you may think of. There may be solutions they hadn't considered on your rotation and your fellowship that you may come up with. But the best solution is always the solution that's best for the patient that has, in terms of your hierarchy of implants, is as close to the primary joint arthroplasty you were hoping to do. Okay. And the number one thing is fracture. The number one thing is fracture. And I will say this to you. 
is on the acetabular side, if you recognize the fracture early, right, and you don't compound the problem. So in, on the acetabular side, you hit it in, right, and it's, it's tight, it's tight, and suddenly it's loose. And so what you mustn't do when that happens is upsize and try and bang it in. But that's what the majority of people do. If you recognize that there's something wrong, you take it out and you see a little crack. The medial wall hasn't gone in, right? And then you actually put this implant with some good screws. So three, even four screws into good bone, right? And then you put your primary implant in and you keep that patient non-weight bearing for six weeks. That is going to do just fine right? It's the same on the femoral side. If you recognize a little crack and you put a cable around it, it is going to just do fine. But if you don't recognize it, then when you do your trial reduction, that's the maneuver where the crack propagates or the thing spins and suddenly you're looking at a very different scenario, right? There, something intraop has gone very wrong, the first thing to do, I would implore all of you, is to stay calm. You've seen bosses, experienced bosses, always stay calm. Inexperienced bosses at that point shout at people, they get tense, and actually the next two hours is very uncomfortable, three hours or four hours is very uncomfortable for everyone. It's no fun. But if you have an experienced calm boss, actually in most scenarios, it's another hour and a half right? And they just, what, what you have to learn from them is not just what they do in that hour and a half, but the plan that they make post-operatively, because that is crucial to this being a good outcome. Okay? And we've seen that. Again, there's a lot to be learned at the arthroplasty meeting, not just from what is done, because between the people on this group, I don't always agree with what is done, and the consequences are not universally great, irrespective of whether I did it. So what I'm saying is I do get it wrong sometimes. But, um, but the, the solution is not always to dive in straight away and do something. There are scenarios where that is incredibly helpful for the patient and actually gets them back onto the track they were on. But there are other situations where I think it's hugely detrimental to the patient, right? Because each operation you do, is a physiological insult and a lot of these patients don't have much gas in the tank right so what you want is them to fill up with gas before you go in otherwise you start to run into secondary problems that i think you could have avoided um so that's trouble and salvage and that's it now i i, I do feel I've, I've i've gone from the simple stuff to some tips and tricks but I'm also aware there are SHOs here. You know, I don't know how much you guys really know about scrubbing, prepping, draping. What, what's your glove size? Prabhu, what's your glove size? Prabhu's not an SHO. No, I know he's not. Well, I, uh, you know, seven and a half. Seven, so what does that mean? What does the seven and a half mean? Oh, UB says his is eight. <laughs> oh, bigger, bigger isn't always better, except in orthopedic implants. Okay, so Prabhu, you hold it. UB, tell me what, what does that mean? When you're size eight, what does that mean? It means that you went up and down and found the, the size that fitted okay, but the fingers were a bit loose, or you can operate for two hours without getting cramp. So actually, it's a measurement that's taken. Where's my camera? from here to here, right? Because that's the crucial bit of a glove that has to fit you in order for your hands to function. So even if your fingers are a bit long, you can pull them so that they buckle up here. The other thing is your inner glove has to be slightly bigger than your outer glove because it's your outer glove that determines your dexterity, especially if you're doing finer stuff. And all the hand guys like Swan don't think we do fine stuff, but we all know that we do. Um, UB says uh, that his, he gets cramps at 7.5. It's very precise for him. Yeah, yeah. So funnily enough, as I've got older, I've had to upsize because of cramp rather than because of uh, dexterity. But I try, if it's a complicated operation, to keep my outer glove as tight, that not giving me cramp. And, um, 
and it seems to be working okay. We used to play, um, we used to play this game with Pete where we would just open random glove sizes for him. <laughs> okay, that's helpful to know. Is this when you're a fellow? Yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> fellow, fellows are always helpful, I find. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, pr uh, prep. What? Sorry, Prabhu, I'm picking on yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, no. Maybe because you're coming. Prabhu, tell me about what prep you use. Uh, I, I don't know if it's scientific or not. Like, uh, uh, for, for the routine primaries and stuff, we always uh, use a soap and scrub, and then uh, we go for a chlorhexidine prep. Okay. Uh, and if it's a trauma surgery, and then if it's an open fracture, then I, I tend to kind of use a beta in scrub. Okay, so, uh, for my prep. so you mentioned chlorhex and betadine. So the social scrubbing didn't exist 10 years ago. I think it's great. So honestly, Pete Bates brought it back from his fellowship in Dallas. I'd seen it in my fellowship in New York, but I didn't bring it back because it was such... What they do there is they take a drip stand and they hang the limb, limb up with some kind of uh, gauze tie, which makes yeah. me nervous. And then they scrub the limb. That's the intern or the junior resident's job. Um, I think it, he brought it back. Now I look at it and I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah. uh, so so some of my bosses back home were like kind of, yeah, anal about it, if I'm allowed to say that. Like, so they used to, like, we used to do like an iodine prep and then kind of uh, put, put them and then wrap them in a sterile sheet beforehand. Yeah, the primary. So, so I, I think, you know, and knowing that these options exist is very good. Then you mentioned that in open fractures, you use betadine. What's the difference between a aqueous and alcoholic? Uh, alcohol kind of denatures the protein. I, I, my understanding is that alcohol denatures the protein. So with open fractures, I think that uh, with the alcohol going in, kind of denatures the protein. So it's da it kind can of be damaging to open tissue as but opposed to juice. aqueous. Yeah. It also so, is more flammable, right? So yeah. when it pools, that's the one that has the problem with catching fire, whereas aqueous doesn't. Yeah. But people do not feel it's as bacteriostatic because uh, uh, betadine is bacteriostatic rather than bactericidal. Yeah. as say for instance something else so people have moved in some areas to combinations so if you work for me i use betadine in my arthroplasty right okay. two, two layers of betadine and then i leave the betadine to dry wet betadine doesn't protect the skin mm. right it's an important yeah. thing to remember i then use chlorhex just yeah. around my incision site okay so the downside for me with Chlorhex, even if they put the pink stuff on, we have a lot of diversity in our patients, is knowing you've accurately covered with two layers everywhere is difficult. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. sheen on the skin and the pink coloration means that the first time round you'll probably get everywhere. But whether mm -hmm. you can hand on heart say you've got everywhere twice, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the second layer of betadine is very, still very visible in terms of it becomes darker and yeah. I, I'm more confident. But you know, again, you talked about evidence. There is some evidence from foot and ankle surgery that using a combination of betadine and then chlorhex is good. Mm -hmm. Other people use spirit to clean away the area. Yes, and bear in mind spirit is also, also flammable. Fine. Okay guys, we've gone for over an hour and a half. I don't know whether that's been helpful or good. Let Miss, Miss uh, Arshad know.